Hi everyone, Stepan here. In today's middle game video I'm going to talk about a very important topic when it comes to strategy in the middle game and that's opposite side castling. Uh, opposite side castling is probably the most fun you could get in a chess game because it leads to very aggressive, volatile, double-edged games in which every tempo matters, in which both sides have to attack, have to create attacking opportunities, have to play fast, don't have time to maneuver or reposition their pieces and basically can't afford to waste any time, otherwise they are going to lose. Uh, this is just a sample pawn structure, it's not from a real game, uh, this could come from the Pirts or the Modern or something else. Uh, just to show you the, the thematic principles uh, of opposite side castling. Uh, when both sides castle king side uh, or queen side, then moving the pawns in front of your king is most often a bad idea. There are exceptions to the rule, but you don't want to move the pawns uh, on the side where your king is castled. That's why when both sides castle on the same side, you often need pieces, positional or, or strategic or tactical solutions to the position in order to create an attack. And you are basically creating an attack with your pieces. Very rarely are you going to use pawns in the attack because you don't want to move the pawns in front of your king. When players castle on opposite sides, the situation is very different because now, if you look at this position, black has three extra attackers on the queen side, which he could use to march uh, on the white king. Conversely, white has four attackers on the king side, which he could use to march up the board towards the black king. So basically, when you castle on opposite sides, you have... Uh, extra attackers which you could use and pawns could be used as cannon meat sort of you could sacrifice the pawns in order to open up lines open up files open up diagonals and create squares for your pieces so very often the attacks are going to be much faster much more aggressive and much more dangerous because of that so if you are able to open up uh, one or two uh, lines towards your opponent king and sacrifice a pawn in the process then it often then it often pays off so this is one major thing about opposite side castling. The fact that you have three or four extra attackers which you could use to open up the road towards your opponent's king. Secondly, uh, the thing you want to do, two things you want to do is firstly, remove the defenders from the side where your opponent's king is castled and bring all of your pieces towards that side of the board while at the same time uh, watching that you don't remove too many defenders from your own king. So those positions... Uh, tend to be very aggressive because it's often very hard to keep enough defenders near your king and to bring enough attackers near your opponent's king. And you have to do that at the same time and your opponent is doing the same thing to you. So it's very hard to play these positions, but I would say that they are very good for improving your chess, especially your chess tactics, because often in these positions uh, players are going to create three or four or five mating opportunities per game and you are going to be forced to stop them, see them, spot them, resolve the issue and create attacking chances of your own. So opposite side castling is quite different to normal chess games where, where both sides castle king side or queen side don't move their pawns in front of their king and try to maneuver their pieces in order to create small advantages. In opposite side castling, it's often a huge advantage, advantage if you make a mistake. If you make one wrong move, you could lose the game. Uh, let's look at the first example. Uh, okay. Uh, the first game I wanted to show you is the game between Aron Nimcovic and Pritzel played in 1922 in Copenhagen. Uh, after d4 we have g6, e4 and the modern defense. I wanted to show you a modern defense example because I'm on the series right now. Bishop g7, knight c3, d6, bishop e3, knight to f6. Uh, this is a standard, the standard defense, uh, the standard line which Nimcovic went for. Knight to f6 is a slightly uncommon move. There are more popular moves. Uh, here, the most common move for white is queen d2 immediately and going for castling queen side, but Nimcovic went bishop e2, castles, queen d2, e5, d5, d5, castles. And here he gave uh, Pritzel the opportunity to exchange the queens, which dampens your attacking power slightly. But still, that was the best move, so queen takes d2, rook takes d2. And now, uh, I wanted to show you this game, this specific game, because it goes against everything I just said uh, in the introduction. When you castle on opposite sides, uh, creating uh, a kingside attack, in this case for white, might be the most obvious choice. I mean, many people would be tempted to play h4, h5, force a concession from black, then try to open up the g-file and play onwards from there. Aron Nimcovic had a different idea. Here c6 was played, a4, stopping b5, knight g4, bishop takes g4, bishop takes g4, knight g2, e2. 
knight e7, rook hd1, knight b6, b3, uh, black was threatening knight c4, knight b6 was a ridiculous move, of course if knight c4 can be played then it's not, but after b3 the knight is just stupid there, so white is already better here, bishop f6 trying to get the bishop out of this dead square on g7, I would prefer the move f5 and trying to cause some troubles on the king side for white f3, bishop e6, a5, chasing the knight away, knight c8, knight a4. And here, Aron Nimtsovic used one simple fact. The fact that black tried to bring an attacker to white's queen side by playing knight to b6, which was a bad move. Knight to b6 gave white a tempo and gave him a square on a4 for his knight. And now, Nimtsovic is going for a positional queen side suffocation, which is going to win the game. And this, I thought, was just remarkable. Black played b6 here, uh, rook to d3 b takes a5, rook to c3, a pawn sacrifice, temporary pawn sacrifice, knight e7, rook c5, fixing the weakness, rook f to b8, knight e to c3, bringing another piece to the queen side, completely neglecting his queen side attack because he figures that it's going to be much better to create chances on the queen side and to play against this bad bishop. a6 was played, rook takes a5, king g7, knight to b6, and this position is already completely losing for black. This is just lost. All of white's pieces are better than all of black's pieces. Black has the bishop pair, which is completely useless because the position is closed. Uh, black has two weaknesses, two isolated pawns, with which white could exploit, and this is just unplayable. Rook a7, knight c to a4, bringing another defender to the b6 square. Rook here, rook takes a6, winning a pawn. Knight c8, knight takes c8, not afraid of this, of course. Rook takes c8, knight to c5, a wonderful move. Uh, bishop bc7, rook to d6, bringing his last piece into play, and now a tactical finish after the mistake, rook d8, rook e6, if black takes, then knight takes e6, winning back the material and completely winning. I wanted to show you this game because it's a wonderful example of how you mustn't neglect strategy and positional chess in opposite side castling. Uh, I, I think people don't talk, talk about this enough in any video where or book where they cover opposite side castling, they mostly focus on, on king side or queen side attacks. But uh, staying focused and looking at the entire board is very important. After the move knight to b6, you need to be aware that that's a mistake and that after knight to b6, hmm, okay, perhaps I don't go for a king side attack, perhaps I could use this, use this mistake, and Nimtsovic did wonderfully. Uh, the next game was a roller coaster uh, in which uh, Caruana was much better and uh, and then he wasn't and uh, Maxim Vashi Legrav won the game. It was an Eidorf, uh, a thematic opposite side castling in Eidorf. I'm not going to go into the theory too much. You can check out the video on the Eidorf if, if you are interested in that. So just let's browse through the opening moves. This is all very standard theory. Both sides castle on opposite side. Sides knight b to d7. And here it's very crucial that you are faster than your opponent. No side, neither side can lose time and neither side can afford uh, defensive moves which are too slow. g4, b5, h4, knight to b6, bringing an attacker into play, looking at the c4 square. Very often black is going to play knight to c4 and force a trade of this bishop. And very often black is going to play rook to c8 and sacrifice on c3. Uh, as I said, it's common to remove the defenders around your king, so rook takes c3 is one of the tactics for black to do that in the Sicilian. Queen to f2, double attacking the knight, rook to b8, g5, knight f to d7, f4. Uh, white's attack seems much faster, and I would always rather have white here, because it seems that black is several tempi away from causing any issues, and uh, black is already faced with the move f5, which would win a piece. Not win a piece, but cause too much trouble. So ef4, bishop f4, rook c8, uh, looking at the knight, so knight to d5, knight takes d5, e d5, bishop g4, bishop e2, takes, takes, rook to e8, looking at the queen, queen to f3, queen to c7. Here, uh, MVL managed to equalize, and uh, it doesn't seem that white's attack is as strong anymore. Of course, Maxim Vashi is a 2800 grandmaster, so he knows how to play this position, positions, and he's obviously the best knight of player who ever lived. Knight d4, uh, bringing the knight to the wonderful square, looking at c6 and d6, and uh, very importantly, defending the mate in one. And this is what happens in opposite side castling. You wouldn't normally see Caruana and Maxim Vashi Legrave threatening mate in one and stuff like that, unless it was opposite side castling. Knight b6, rook hg1, bishop f8, rook e8, 
Rook e8, knight f5. And here it seems that white's attack is much better still. He doesn't have enough pieces to checkmate, but it seems that he can create some opportunities to cause problems for black. And now things start to turn around. Queen to c4, looking at a2. b3, nah, I would prefer king to b1. Queen before c3, another dubious move, weakening the squares around his king. And now this is what happens, this is what you have to look out for. When your opponent's attack starts on the side where your king is, uh, very often people start to panic and start moving the pawns around their king and that could lead to problems like here because the squares are now very weak. Rook c8, double attacking. Rook d3, defending. Knight takes d5. This was a very nice tactical move and obviously it would be really really bad to take the knight firstly because the bishop is hanging, secondly because if you take with the rook then rook takes c3 wins the queen. So if you take with the rook Rook takes c3, winning the queen. If you take with the queen, queen takes bishop check and then you're in trouble. So bishop to d2 was played, defending, knight b6, king b1. Now king b1, he should have played king b1 instead of b3. Queen c5, bishop to e3, attacking the queen. Queen c7, queen to f4. And here uh, Caruana sort of lost his edge, uh, rook e8, h5, trying an attack, and now this was a perfect example of how even very strong grandmasters could, could make a mistake. Here the pawn is hanging, so he should have taken. Uh, there's some tactical opportunities with the bishop because there's a back rank mate, so black can't take bishop e3 at the end of the line uh, because white is threatening checkmate. So he wanted to create an attack, he has a knight on f5, which is very strong, he, he thought, okay, f5, I'm going to, uh, h5, I'm going to play g6, storm the black king, play knight h6, check, queen takes f2 or something, he, he saw some opportunities, but h5 actually loses a very valuable tempo. Rook e6, defending everything, king to c2, queen c6, bishop takes b6, trading pieces, queen takes b6, rook to f3. Another bad move, which... I mean, it's, it's fairly obvious, you want to attack f7, but it just doesn't work. Queen b7 attacking the rook and uh, threatening uh, queen to g2 checks in some positions, and also defending f7. Knight to e3, another mistake. Rook to e4 attacking the queen, queen to g3, rook e5, queen to f4, and this position is now already losing in a matter of moves. It's really hard to understand why, but why doesn't have an attack anymore? There's nothing there anymore. I mean... Uh, why just can't do anything? He should have played g6 trying to open up the position, but here rook takes g5. Of course, if white takes the rook, then the rook on f3 is hanging. So h6, a desperate move, trying to open up the position now. H takes uh, g takes h6, rook to f2, defending queen g2 checks and rook g2 checks, queen d7, knight to f5, queen to e6. And in this position, Fabiano Caruana actually gave up. You can see the engine evaluation, it's minus two and a half, it's just unbearable. Obviously the attack didn't work, white sacrificed some pawns for the attack and white is now three pawns down and the attack slowed down and that's it. You have to be careful when sacrificing material for a kingside attack or a queenside attack when you castle on opposite sides because if too many pieces get traded off and the attack doesn't work then you're just three pawns down. And in this case Fabiano Caruana did that, so you can go badly wrong. Uh, one of my favorite openings now, the Karo Khan, and I'm going to show you how uh, Karyakin uh, played against Gustafsson. Gustafsson played the Karo Khan here. The, they went into the classical with bishop f5. Once again, if you don't know the theory, check out the video on the classical Karo Khan, bishop g6. This is all main, 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 main line theory. Okay, opposite side castling. And now, once again, you need to be fast. Knight e4 is a move here, uh, the main move, which was played. Uh, by Karyakin, takes, 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 this is all theory, queen d5, queen d5 is a, I wouldn't say the most popular move, I, I think this is quite a strange, strange move, bishop e3, knight g4, bishop c1, and now uh, Gustafsson is trying to open up the c-file for his rooks, and he did that, but in the process he allowed the white rook to the second rank. Now, which side would you rather have? Um, you can see the en engine evaluation on the right side of the board, unfortunately. So you can see that white is better. But from a visual perspective, try to think with your own head. Uh, who is faster here? Try to... Uh, what I usually do uh, in opposite side castling games, I try to give five moves to my opponent. Try to do that. What if black was to play now and have five more moves? What would he do? He's threatening the, the c2 pawn obviously, so 
perhaps a move like bishop to e3 is very strong uh, after bishop takes here it's not enough so this isn't really a threat uh, he could move the bishop somewhere else not sacrificing it perhaps uh, to d4 and they then take here and then threaten here that might actually be, be a good idea okay so bishop to d4 uh, if white doesn't have a move then queen takes here check king here uh, how do i get rid of the bishop okay and let's give white five moves g4 g5 and that's it i mean that there's just nothing for black to do if black manages to open up the h file and play h6 or open up the g file by playing g takes h6 then white is just much better so g4 was played by karyakin bishop to b6 attacking the, the c2 pawn rook to h2 simply defending laterally f5 uh, trying to stop things but no <laughs> queen to e2 attacking the e6 weakness fg4 queen e6 check king h8 queen takes g4 just done white's attack was so much faster and black could have resigned here he didn't he went on for a few more moves but this was just too much a nice tactical finish rook takes here and uh, yeah you are just losing there's there's nothing here you can't do anything this is plus seven so if you are slow then you can go badly wrong i've actually played one game you can find it on the channel in the classical karo khan when i lost terribly to a kingside pawn storm just g4 g5 and i i wanted to resign on move 15 so it's very common in the karo khan to to have this happen that's why very often players actually castle on opposite side on the same side in the karo khan people will play bishop e6 queen to c7 and castle here because it's it doesn't run into the uh, kingside pawn storm and in the karo khan specifically white is often faster than black Okay, the next game, uh, Movsesian versus Nakamura. This this is also one of my favorite openings, uh, the Mises Kotrot Scandinavian. This game was played in 2010. And in this game, Movsesian actually made a mistake. Uh, here, this is a very common variation where, where black goes for queenside castling as soon as possible. A variation in which white doesn't play knight to c3 immediately chasing the queen away, but goes for knight to f3. Bishop e3. I'm not going to go into the opening moves too much. Uh, in, in this position, I actually like Movsesian's, uh, Movsesian's game. I, I've had this 50 times in Blitz games and a few times in tournament games as well. And I think White has uh, enough chances, even though uh, Black's game is very aggressive. And by the way, White can also go for queenside castling in positions like this one. But here, after bishop takes e3, bishop takes e3, knight e2, queen e2, rook h8, rook d1, c6. In this position, white decided to castle, and here the best move was d6, uh, trying to advance the pawn, perhaps try to play c5, create a very strong passed pawn, and I'm not sure why he didn't play that, uh, I think it's fairly obvious that d6 is a good move, he castled, and now look at the evaluation change, boom, minus one and a half, and uh, the engines hate the move castles because it doesn't give enough chances, and because it allows the, the, the d pawn to be traded off, cd5, Bishop takes c5 was his idea, but that was also a bad move. And it sort of does open up the black king, but where are your pieces? Your rook is still on f1, you only have a dark squared bishop which is strong and you walked into a pin. Uh, just bad. Knight d7, attacking the bishop twice. Rook takes d5, defending the bishop. f6, winning a piece. Over. f4, fe5, fe5, queen e6, and there's nothing there. There's just nothing there. This was a game I wanted to show you because I often get positions like this myself and I often get tempted to castle on the opposite side because obviously the black king is unsafe. But if you have too few pieces on the board and if black has very active pieces, both rooks on the semi-open files and uh, a great knight as opposed to your bishop, then you should really be careful. This game is a warning that you shouldn't always castle on the opposite side. Uh, the next game, uh, a wonderful Petrov, or Russian game, a very thematic opening in which white plays knight c3. So this variation of the Petrov uh, is where white plays knight c3 goes for queenside castling. Uh, remember what uh, I showed this in the video with blunders. Anand had this position in 88, he played bishop f5 and resigned on move 6, <laughs> so don't play bishop f5. Uh, so here the best move is to take, take, white plays queen to d2 and castles, and black is going to castle uh, kingside. b3, h6, bishop to e2, queen d7, king b1, always play king b1. Uh, here, 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 here. Castles. 
Now, uh, <clears throat> what do you do here? You have a bishop, queen and two rooks to attack with. Uh, black seems to have uh, advanced pawns, which can easily create problems. So Vishyanand started uh, his play with c4, dampening the bishop on e6. I actually like this move, because now if, if c5 is played, you can go for a plan of queen c3, bishop f3, bishop here, taking up the square, and if black gives up the d5 square, then he's going to be weaker. Rook f8, bishop to f3, he does go for that. Rook a to b8, defending the pawn passively, and the problem is that white has two pawns here, and if b5 is played, perhaps white can just take. c5 was played by white here, uh, which is a very aggressive move, I don't know if I would ever consider that. d5, h4, b6, rook h to e1. This game is another example uh, similar to the Nimtsovich game, which we saw in the first example, where white is trying to stop counterplay and to create positional weaknesses on the queen side because he doesn't believe the attack is strong enough, and I actually like this approach uh, by Anand. Uh, b c5, queen c5, rook b5, queen a3, queen c6. Uh, black's attack is obviously stronger, but... Uh, uh, trusting Anand in this position is, I think, a good thing, and uh, he's a very strong player who understands these positions really well, and even though the engines say it's equal, I think that black has overextended on the queen side, black has created too many weaknesses for not that much, and the bishop on e6 does look nice, there does seem to be some opportunities for sacrificing, but Anand is going to prove him wrong. Bishop, uh, queen to b2, sorry, a5, trying to open up the position, c4, a very aggressive move because the pawn is pinned to the queen and this actually resolves all the issues rook c5 cd5 and nothing else uh, can happen for black king a1 queen to d7 just better for white two very weak pawns on the queen side black didn't manage to create an attack and i mean mamedyarov could have resigned here and now vishyanand is starting to create chances of his own and here you can see that the positional weaknesses are going to tell and that uh, white is going to be just much faster and much better. Here Mamedyarov actually created a tactical opportunity for, for, for Vishyanand, but you can see here that white is clear two pawns up and he's going to win the game. So another example of how an opposite side castling attack backfired and the material you sacrificed for an attack just proved to be too much of a liability. You traded too many pieces off and... It didn't work. The next game is another example of when not to castle uh, queenside. Uh, this is a classical Nimco, Queen C2 Nimco. Bomb versus Ludek Pachman, 1979. Uh, a thematic position in which you often see players castling queenside, but here it didn't work. So Queen C2, theory, 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 theory. Very thematic position. Here uh, you shouldn't really castle queenside. You shouldn't castle queenside. There are better moves, and rook d1 can be played, a3 can be played. Those are all better moves. Rook uh, rook to d1, I think, is the most sensible. Uh, however, in this position, uh, Bohm castled queenside. After castles queenside, uh, I think black is just much faster. I mean, very often you are going to see in in uh, king pawn in queen pawn games uh, situations like this one where white is trying to create chances with opposite side castling but you have to be very careful i think you have to be much more careful in queen pawns opening because often white is going to be missing his c pawn or already have the c uh, the c file open uh, so uh, bishop to e7 obviously in e4 openings white doesn't play c4 that often c5 b6 and the uh, stuff is just getting open uh, white is nowhere near to creating a kingside attack, and even though this c-pawn looks aggressive, I think that white has overextended, and the move such as a6 is going to be bringing tons of trouble to his position. Uh, knight e5, a6, uh, g4, <laughs> just, I mean, okay, for now the pawn is pinned, so the rook is hanging, the bishop can't be taken, but f6, chasing another piece away, knight d3, queen c7, knight b4, rook a7, bishop to e2, and uh, white's queen side is just getting massacred. I, I hate this position for uh, for white. In fact, this is minus three and a half. And uh, he actually resigned here. Ludek uh, won the game. Uh, if you turn on the engine, it's minus three and a half. Because what can white do? I mean, <clears throat> you're going to trade off your queen. 
your position is weaker, you are two pawns down, you are forced to, create, to trade the queens and you are going to lose. So once again an example of how your opponent's counterplay and your dubious sacrifices lead to a lost position. So it didn't work here either. Uh, the next game was actually a draw and I wanted to show you this last because both players played uh, almost perfectly. They didn't play too many moves outside of theory but this just goes to show that you can master opposite side castling in your own openings in order not to lose. Leko was white, Carlsen was black 2008 and this was a typical Yugo Yugoslav attack in the dragon. If you're interested in the dragon check out the video. So okay, here here. Okay, all theory, bishop to b3, knight to e5, theory, king to b1, always play king b1. I'm quoting Ben Feingold too often, rook e8, h4, starting an attack. Uh, here, uh, if black isn't careful, uh, he could get a lost position very quickly. And uh, it's very scary for black if he doesn't play the correct theoretical move h5, stopping counterplay. Uh, bishop to h6, trading the defender. Okay. Uh, in this position it's it's still it's still mainline theory and both sides are playing perfectly now again uh, ask yourself which side is faster what would happen if black had five moves what would happen if white had five moves i think it's much more scary for the player with the black pieces because white still has three defenders around his king black only has one so in the dragon yugoslav attack it's often easier to play for white because you can get reinforcements uh, into the defense and into the attack. You have moves such as knight to f5, sacrificing, you have g4 and stuff. Knight d5 was played here. Uh, e5, chasing the d4 knight away. Knight takes f6, queen takes f6, knight to b3. Black has created a weakness on d5 and uh, sort of stopped the attack. Now white no longer has that many pieces. Rook e to c8. And now black is starting an attack of his own, threatening rook takes c2. Uh, queen takes d6 was, was played, the best move, uh, bishop e6, c3, b5, queen to d2, a5, starting an attack, and now perhaps he could have taken, he was probably scared to open up lines, uh, queen to g5 was played instead, uh, uh, a worse move, and now after queen takes g5, a ta h takes g5, this is just unfortunately an equal position in which they both managed to defend, so very often in Super Grandmaster games this is going to happen, they are going to play perfectly, but in your own game, it's, games it's not. So I would recommend playing openings with, with opposite side castling, such as the Nidorf or the Dragon or the Scandinavian or the Modern. And I would always recommend you go for the variations where you can castle on opposite sides, especially if you are a lower rated player like I am, because that will sharpen your tactics and improve, improve your play significantly. Uh, you're going to be much better at uh, attacking chess if you try this. So, sorry for the long video, I hope you liked it. I hope I gave enough examples and that it was clear enough. Uh, please let me know what you think. Uh, recommend some opposite side castling games in the comments below, I would appreciate that. And uh, thanks very much for watching, stay tuned for more chess. Bye bye, see you later.